morning, Fielder. Say good morning, Fielder. Hey, how are you? Yeah, I love it. Welcome to church. If you're ready to be blessed by the Lord this morning, I have a scripture I want to read for us this morning. So we can hear a revelation from God and we can respond in worship. Sound good? From Psalm 63, it says this. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. Listen to this. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. Y'all hear that command? It's time to praise, praise God. Y'all ready? Y'all stand with me. Let's worship the King of Kings, the only King forever. Come on. Make sure we're woken up this morning. Come on. Y'all sing oh with me right here. Come on. Say oh. God, a firm foundation, and our rock, the only solid ground, as nations arise and fall, hey, hey. and kingdoms once strong now shaken, but we trust forever in your name, in the name of Jesus, come on, lift it up if you trust in him, come on. We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. And you are the only King forever. Come on. Forevermore, say it. He's unmatched, come on, y'all sing it out. And unmatched in all your wisdom, in love and justice you will reign. Say, and every knee will bow. And we bring our expectations, our hope is anchored in your name, in the name of Jesus. And we trust it, come on. Oh, oh, we trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. And you are the only King forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only Almighty God, we lift Hey, you are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. 
Anybody was watching football this weekend? Yeah? Anybody get excited for football this weekend? Got a little bit excited. Let me tell you something. Jesus has brought us from death to life whenever we choose to follow him. He, 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 is, he is worthy of all of our praise. And he is worthy for us to get loud for him. Do you all agree with that? So can we roll around on an A again so like we can fit? Yo, we finished the song. Let's try that again. God, God is a God full of grace, so He can give us another chance. Are you? Come on. Are you? Are you excited? Did Jesus bring you from death to life, or what? Yes, yeah. Come on. Yes, He's better. That's right. Let's keep it going. Come on. Y'all sing with me, here we go. I close my eyes and colors fly. There's no hiding from your grace. I can't deny your heart from mine. And it's unrelenting chase. I was on the edge of deception. Caught up in my own hesitation. Until your love took over me.
if you're grateful this morning, let's give Jesus some praise. You know, there's the reason why Kyle gave us this dance move right here. Because the only thing I can do is that, that one right there. So. Hey, thanks, man. Appreciate you taking it. Hey, Reggie, he does some crazy I can't ever do what he's doing, but I, I can do that move right here. <laughs> Y'all almost started dancing. It was, it was great, man. I, I thought we might not be Baptists anymore. It was awesome. <laughs> I love being Baptist for you hardcore Baptists. Don't, don't get all crazy on me. Hey, guys, if you're a guest over here, I'm so grateful that you chose to be with us this morning. You might be thinking, like, are they having some kind of special service, some kind of party over here? No, it's a party every Sunday because Jesus is risen and we celebrate it. And like you heard Kyle talking about, this is something worth celebrating. And we are so glad you chose to be in here. If you're a guest, you may not realize, but every Sunday we gather together, we take the Lord's Supper. And we don't do it as a rote, routine kind of thing. We do it because we believe the centerpiece of our celebration is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And we want to make sure there doesn't go a Sunday when we're gathered together that passes by that we don't stop and celebrate the price that was paid so that we could come in here and sing our praises and sing the goodness of God. That price is illustrated for us in the elements of the Lord's Supper. And so we're going to, in the middle of our worship time of singing praises to God, we're going to remember the cost that was paid so we could sing to him. And so we're going to come. There's tables. You'll see four here. There's a couple on the sides. There's a few in the back as well. You find the nearest table to you. And I, and I know we have guests with us this morning. There are two cups that are stacked, one on top of the other. So you'll go to that table. You'll pick up the pair of cups. One will have bread and one will have juice. These represent the body and the blood of Christ, that Christ's body was sacrificed on the cross, that his blood was spilled out of his precious body onto that unsuspecting ground and it's a reminder that his blood makes us holy. And it's a chance for you to say, thank you, God, that you would love me so much that you would send your son to do this for me. And we're going to get to celebrate him. Now, this is only for those of you who have confessed faith in Christ. This is a symbol of faith of believers. So if you haven't yet, you can stay right where you are. There'll be a lot of people moving around you, but stay where you are. You can be a part of the song that we're going to be singing and just watch this. But if you're a believer, I'm going to invite you to these tables. And you don't have to wait for me to take it. You can, when you're ready... You can say, God, I honor you. I remember your body. I remember your blood and celebrate who he is. So I'm going to ask you all to stand. I'm going to ask the ushers and the deacons to make their way to the tables to get the Lord's Supper ready. And during this next song, I want to invite you to celebrate the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus as we take the Lord's Supper. It's open to you. Yeah. 
changing one for you who was and is to come your promise sure you will not let go there is hope Save the world to love, and this hope is an anchor for my soul. Our God will stand unshakable. There is hope in the promise of the cross. You gave everything to save the world to love. This hope is an anchor for my soul. Now sing this with me. Our God will stand. He's unshakable. Yes, He is. Say His name. With your name is high. Your name is greater in all my hope is in you. We your word unfailing, your promise unshaking, and all my hope is in you. We your name is higher, your name is greater. And all my hope is in you. With your word, sun failing, your promise unshaken. And all my hope is in you. What a, what a great thought for us this morning. Just the, the magnitude of the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. That we, we proclaim his death every time we take the Lord's Supper because we know death isn't the end. There's resurrection and we have hope in that resurrection and in that power. And so we can gather together and celebrate that week after week and stare death in the face and say he lives. Therefore we will live. What a beautiful promise. I think there are times in our lives where we need that encouragement and that promise and that reminder. I also know there are many means of encouragement. And I want to I let you guys uh, one last time know about an event coming up soon called Lavish. 
where it is specifically for the ladies to be encouraged, to be poured into. You've hopefully got the email that my wife and I sent out telling you about this event. But today is the last day to sign up. So one last reminder, if you'd like tickets to it, you can go online and get tickets for it. Sign up. It's going to be on Friday the 31st of this month right here in this room. It's going to be a great event. So I want to encourage you to do that. But listen, every Sunday we have um, need, need to, to not just declare faith in song, but to exercise faith in a tangible expression. And one of the ways that we do that is by saying, God, I'm going to give to you through tithes and offerings what you've given to me. I'm going to take a certain portion of that, and I'm going to give to your church, give towards your cause so the world can know your goodness. If you were here last week and you heard about some of the great things God is doing through the tithes and the offerings of the church, if you didn't, I encourage you to go online and listen to last week's message to hear how God is changing the world as we give radically and generously. But I also want to say in the middle of that, if you're a guest, please don't feel like there's, there's any payment you got to pay. There's going to be a basket that goes by you. There is no requirement to put anything in that basket. To put something in the basket is an act of faith, and you should only do so if you can do so by faith. So if you're a guest, there's a guest registry card in front of you. You can fill that card out, and maybe that's what you put in there to let us know that you were here so that we can partner with you on your spiritual journey because we believe God wants us to be partners with you. So we'd love to know that you were here. But you don't have to give if you don't want to, if you, if you feel led to, by all means, absolutely. But church family, this is a chance for us to say, I trust you, God. It's yours. Take it. Let me pray over this offering and we'll continue to worship. God, thank you for being good to us, for loving us, for giving a reason for us to serve you. And I pray, God, that you would receive these tithes and these offerings as something that pleases you. As you look at our hearts and you see hearts that say, we trust you, God, take it. It's yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
are with grateful hearts. No shadow you. Father, we're so grateful this morning. Even though we didn't deserve it, you still came and you sent Jesus for us so that we can have a right relationship with you, Father. We are grateful this morning. God, we give you all of our praise. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Y'all may be seated. somebody to do one simple thing, just one thing, just to watch them turn around and totally forget to do the one thing you told them to do? If you got kids, I'm fairly certain that, that's happened to you before. Not, not too long ago, uh, we had decided in our home we were going to have uh, pizza movie night. We like to at least once a month have these pizza movie nights where we can get the whole tribe together, come and gather together in the den, and we throw towels on the ground so that we can eat our pizza there where we're watching a movie and we love these. They're great memory times for us. And this particular time, uh, this not too long ago, it was an unexpected pizza movie night because the kids were supposed to be gone, but I can't remember why some plans were canceled. And so Virginia and I decided, let's throw in there an extra pizza movie night. Let's make it super special. And we were going to make it really special because we weren't just going to watch a Netflix movie. We were going to go all the way to Redbox and pick up a movie. I mean, this is big time. And, and we weren't going to just make our own homemade pizzas. We were going to Papa Murphy's to get the good stuff. And not just the $5 faves. I'm talking about the signature pizzas. I'm talking about the kinds that our kids beg for but we never buy because they're too expensive. We were going to get them going all out. Now, I don't know if you know anything about Papa Murphy's, but it's, it's what you call a take and bake pizza place because you take it and you bake it in your own oven, which someone would say, well, why in the world would you do that? Because they're amazing. That's why you do that. They are incredible pizzas. Now, our family's big, so it takes three pizzas for us to feed our family. We don't have a double oven. We've got a single oven, which means it takes a lot of time to cook these pizzas. Now, because this was an unexpected pizza movie night, we were getting a little bit later of a start. So we had a real confined schedule because we have an ending time for anything at night because we have two four-year-olds. And after a certain point, they get really cranky, really whiny, and it gets really hard to be around them. So they have a set end time. And we need to get the pizzas cooked, everything ready, so that we can watch the whole movie before it's over. Because you know anything about Redbox? Like, you got a countdown. you got to watch it all at one time. 
So we have this thing mapped out beautifully. It's scheduled. Virginia has to do some grocery shopping at Kroger, but she was going to go do that. I was going to go pick up the movie, then pick up the pizzas, come home while the kids kind of held the fort down, and we were going to make it. We had the window. It was going to work. There was just one requirement. I pulled my three older kids together before I left, and I said, guys, I need you to do one thing for me. I need you to preheat the oven so that when I get home, I can just throw the pizzas in and we can go. Because it takes like 15 minutes to get the, the oven up there. So we, I, it would really help a ton. So here's what I want you to do. At exactly 6 p.m., which is like five or six minutes later, I want you to turn the oven to 425 degrees. You got it? You're like, got it. No, 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 no. Repeat to me what I just told you. They said 6 p.m., 425 degrees. Got it? Got it. Wait, 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 wait. Show me that you know how to turn on the oven. Yeah, okay. Great. Got it? Got it. Okay. 6 p.m., 425. Check. All right. I'm going. Oven needs to be on when I get home so I can throw the pizzas in. Got it. I leave. Virginia's at the grocery store this whole time. Pick up the movie. Pick up the pizzas. About 20 minutes later, I get home. Go sliding into the kitchen to throw the pizzas in. And guess what's not on? The oven. I pull them together. Kids, I told you to do one thing, and you didn't do it. I was so frustrated with them. Now, here's what's interesting about it. My kids didn't do anything wrong when, when I was gone. They didn't burn the house down. They didn't destroy anything. They actually did some pretty good stuff. One of my kids went outside to play. I love it when they go play outside, kind of just burn some energy. Another kid was reading a book. How do I get angry with a kid for reading a book? She was reading a book. Another kid, one of the older ones, actually took some of the younger ones and played a game with them. And I love watching the older kids play with the younger kids. I mean, they did some great stuff. But they didn't do the one thing I asked them to do. And let me tell you, it didn't matter all the other good stuff they did. I was not happy. Because now we were off schedule. And I know that doesn't sound like much until you get two cranky four-year-olds, and it sounds like a whole lot. And now I didn't know how we were going to make it. So you know what I did? I threw the pizzas away, and I said, you're going to bed without dinner. I didn't do that, people. Golly. <laughs> What kind of jerk do you think I am? No, of course we didn't do that. We, we went ahead and cooked the pizzas. We threw the movie in, and we watched the movie. But I promise you, my kids paid the price for it. Because right at the climax of the movie, right when it's getting close to the end, that's when they start unleashing the cracking down. They start screaming and whining and because they're so tired, they're ready for bed. Ruins the ending of the movie. Why? Because my kids didn't do the one thing I told them to do. Now, here's what's interesting. As frustrated as I was with my kids that particular evening, I just got to imagine it pales in comparison to how Jesus must feel toward his followers. Because he said, I want you to do one thing for me, and it's the one thing we most epically fail at. Before he went to Papa Murphy's, he said, I'm going to be coming back. I want you to do one thing. I want you to make disciples. And we conveniently forget to do the one thing he told us to do. I want you to look at when he gave us this command. It's in Matthew 28. So open your Bibles. Gospel of Matthew. Very first book of the New Testament. Go to the very last chapter, the very last three verses of the book of Matthew. Matthew 28. We're going to read verses 18 through 20. Now while you're finding this, it's called the Great Commission. I'm certain many of you have heard this before. I want you to remember when this commission was given. So Jesus, just a few days, weeks at most, before he gives his command, has been brutally murdered after being severely tortured by his own people who rejected him. Three days later, completely unexpected by everybody, including his own disciples, he resurrects from the dead. And he appears to his disciples, and he says, here's what I want you to do. The very thing we fell so miserably at. Read it with me. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Now, this commission is something that is as clear as can possibly be. Jesus left no ambiguity. I'm leaving. I'm going to come back. Before I get back, here's what I want you to do. Make disciples. Repeat it to me. Make disciples. Jesus is saying, walk in this with me. I want this to be super clear. Now, now, let me ask you a simple but very abrasive question. How many disciples are you making? Now, I, I got to be honest. There are many of you in here who would give a lot of answers to a lot of good things that you do. And praise God for it. 
There are many of you in here who, man, you read your Bible, you study it, you wake up in the mornings and you pray. Praise God for it. There are many of you, you give large amounts of your money away because you're radically generous. You are doing great things like adopting children and teaching Bible studies. And you're doing great things like trying to help people around you who are in need and trying to be kind and spread the love of Jesus. Man, praise God for all those things. We shouldn't stop doing any of them. But let me ask you a question. If we do all those things, and we fail to do the one thing he asked us to do, when he gets back, do you think he's going to say, well done? I don't think he'll say, well done, any more than I did to my children when they did a bunch of great stuff, but they didn't do the one thing I asked them to do. Now, I know, I know this is heavy. And I know there are some of you going, man, Jason, I came here this morning. I needed some encouragement, not you slapping me around in the face. I know I'm not perfect. I know I have faults. I don't need you pointing that out, Jason. I was just feeling good, man. Kyle was leading me in the presence of the Lord. I was feeling all lifted up, and here you are, pulling all the wind right out of my cells. And right now you're saying to yourself, Jason, you're not being fair, man. You don't understand my circumstances. Listen, not that I don't want to make disciples. It's just that, and then you fill in the blank. It's just that right now, man, this is a super crazy season for me. I, I just Things are out of control. I'd love to do it. I just have no margin in my life to do it. Let me go ahead and say, I I understand crazy seasons, trust me. As a leader of a large church, as a father of six, I know what it means to be crazy busy. But let me also tell you, it's never going to slow down. I know you think around the corner things are going to get better, but let me tell you, there's crazy around that corner. And there's crazy around that other corner. You don't make disciples when things settle down. You make disciples in the middle of the crazy. To which some of you go, no, but that's not my issue, Jason. See, my issue is that I haven't learned enough. I haven't grown enough spiritually. My faith is weak. How am I going to pass a weak faith on to somebody else? Which I get. Absolutely. It would be great for us to be able to learn more and grow more, but let me go ahead and tell you, making disciples is a lot like having kids. You're never really going to be ready for it. You do it anyway. You make disciples even when you're not ready. Now, I know some of you would say, no, but that's not my issue. See, my issue is I don't even know what to do because I've never been discipled. Which actually, that's probably the best excuse you have. But it's the excuse I intend to take away from you over the rest of the month of January. Because this this morning we're beginning a three-week sermon series on the whole process of being discipled and making disciples. And we're going to teach you through God's word what this looks like, what the call of God is. I know sermons will not be enough, so we're offering you an opportunity. An opportunity to learn on the job as we prepare what we call discipleship groups or D groups. Where you get in a relationship with one on three where you have learning and accountability and you grow in your faith, where you get discipled so that you can go out and disciple others. We invest in you so that we can equip you and send you out to invest in others. We're ready to offer that, every bit of it to you. You just got to decide this is what Jesus requires of you. And this is why this passage of Scripture is so important. Look back at verse 19 again with me in Matthew 28. Jesus starts off, he says, "'Go therefore and make disciples of all nations.'" Now, if you're reading a red-letter Bible, which means Jesus' words are in red, this is all in red, which means that this is all from Jesus. He is speaking this. In other words, the man who in verse 18 said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me is commanding us to make disciples. You, You might not see how clear the command is in English, but in the Greek, it is very clear. You could literally translate it, having gone then, make disciples. So the imperative, the command, is the act of making disciples. He says, as you're going through life, here's what I want you to do. I want you to make disciples. So Jesus, the dude who has been resurrected from the dead, who has all authority in heaven and earth, has come to us and not given us a divine suggestion. He has given us an order. Make disciples. He could not be any clearer. And yet this is still one of the things that we so colossally fail at. And I think we have to wrestle the question, why? Why, if its command is so clear to us, and so many of us have heard this before, why do we not do it? I think there are four reasons why we don't do it. And here's what I want to do for the rest of the time I have you this morning. I want to walk you through these four reasons. And if you wouldn't mind, I'd love for you to take some notes. You can jot jot them down, put them on your phone, whatever you need to do. But write down the question or the reason why, and then take some notes in the biblical answer underneath it. Because I want you to to be armed to deal with these as they surface in your life. Because they will over and over again. So here's the first reason that we don't make disciples. We don't make disciples because we just don't see it as our job. That's the first reason why. We don't make disciples because we just don't think it's our job to do it. We don't see it as our job. We see it as a job of the church. And by church, 
we mean the institution of the church. It's not my job, Jason. It's your job to make disciples. That's what many of you would think. And in your mind, it's a very Western way to look at things. Here's how it works. You would say, it's the institution. It's the staff. It's their job. They're the ones who are supposed to make disciples. And so we expect people to come to church, to hear the gospel, to repent of their sins. We baptize them. We train them. We equip them. We disciple them. And good to go, we kick out disciples. And your job is to applaud us and to pay for it. But let me tell you, that, that is not what Jesus said. He did not say, sit back and let the institution of the church make disciples. Now, if some of you step up your game, you may even invite people to church, but the moment they get here, they're yours, Jason. You got them. He didn't say invite people to the institution of the church so that the church can make disciples. He said, you go and make disciples. Do you want to know why he didn't challenge the institution of the church to do it? There was no institution of the church. Jesus is talking to a bunch of nobodies that are not, there's no clergy, there's no seminary, there's no institutionalized church at this moment. He's got this ragamuffin group of people, and he's saying, you guys, I want y'all to make some disciples. This is the exact same thing he's saying to us. It's inherent in the command. Having gone then, make disciples. The first part of it is this assumption that we have already gone out. We live in society. While we are doing life, while we are living sent, we will make disciples. In other words, when you make, build relationships with your neighbors, make disciples. When you build relationships with your coworkers, make disciples. When you build relationships with the parents of your kid's soccer team, make disciples. Don't expect the church to come to you, or the people to come to the church. You be the church to go to the people. You go out and make disciples. Now, I want to pause right there for a moment because I want to say this right here is the thing we fail the most at because how crazy is that thought to you, really, if you stopped and thought about it, of you going to one of the other parents in your kid's soccer team going, hey, uh, you want to know Jesus and you want me to disciple you? Be like, oh, crazy person. Like, none of us want to do that. That seems like so over the top to go to your coworker, I'm going to get fired if I try to talk to him about Jesus. How do I make disciples out there? And we just assume it's not really our role. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because I don't want to embarrass you and I don't want to embarrass me. But I wonder how many of us have never in our life made one single disciple. And yet the very thing Jesus told us to do was to go make disciples of all nations. We are failing at the one thing he told us to do, because statistics show that in a room this size, there will only be a few dozen who in their lifetime will make just one single disciple. We're failing at it. I know right now you're going, man, such a discouraging mess. Someone's going to have to teach Jason, Jason how to preach, because he, he just keeps discouraging us. And I, I only know, It's not my intent to discourage you. It is not my intent to tell you how bad of a job you're doing. I want you to know I'm in the throes of failing miserably in this category. But I also know one day, I am going to stand before Almighty God himself. And when he gets back from Papa Murphy's and the oven isn't on, when he gets back to the church and we didn't do the one thing he told us to do, he's not just going to look at you and ask you why it didn't happen. He's going to look at me as your shepherd, and he's going to say, Jason, why didn't you challenge him to do this? And I know that day comes and his piercing eyes are looking at me. I don't want to say I was too afraid to preach this message. I don't want to say, no, they'd already heard it before. I want to at least be able to say, if we're not doing our job, that I told them they were supposed to do it again and again and again and again, because I know when I stand before him, I want to say something. So the reason I'm preaching this message that I have preached many times over my tenure here at Fielder is because I want to say to Jesus, I did my best to spur him on to it. I don't want it to be because you didn't know it was your job. But you know, if you're a part of Fielder, I believe there are many of you who already know this is your job. Our whole vision statement is that we inhale and exhale the gospel and make disciples who do the same. There are about eight of you who should be covenant members now because no one else got that. Inhale and exhale the gospel and make disciples. That's the very core of our vision. If you go outside into the wall, you'll see a big old thing that says make disciples on it. If you've been around Fielder for a while, you know this is your job. You're not doing it because of a lack of knowledge. I think there's a different thing holding you back. There's a second reason why we don't make disciples. We don't make disciples 
because we just don't know how to do it. That's the second reason. We don't make disciples because we just don't know how. We don't even know where to start. We don't even know what to do. We just don't know how to do it. This goes back to what I said before. Most of us have never been discipled, so we don't know how to disciple somebody else. We can't make disciples. Most of us don't even know how to clearly share our faith with somebody else. So even if they did come to Christ, magically somehow, we wouldn't even know what to do with them. A new believer, I don't know, do I teach you the Bible? Is there some kind of class I'm supposed to take you to? Is there a curriculum or some doctrine? I mean, I don't, where do I even start? We don't know, and so we're so overwhelmed, paralysis sets in. And we just throw our hands in the air going, I can't do it. So, so can I just demystify and can I declutter this whole task of making disciples? I'm going to make it exponentially more simple for you right now. The task of making disciples is as easy as taking what you've been given and passing it on to somebody else. That's all there is to it. Making disciples is about staying one step ahead of the people behind you and just passing it on. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul tells his protege, Timothy. I want you to stay in Matthew 28, but let me read for you 2 Timothy chapter 2 in verses 1 and 2. Here he's speaking to the guy that he's discipled, and he says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Very simple. Paul just says, Timothy, you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have everything figured out. Just take what you get received from me and entrust it to other people who can entrust it to other people who can entrust it to other people. That's all there is to it. It is not supremely complicated. You take what you've been given and entrust it to somebody else. Now, I want to be real clear. This doesn't just mean passing on information. It doesn't just mean that you take what you've learned in a Bible study and you teach it to somebody else. That word entrust is very important. To entrust, that Greek word means to deposit into and to lay under the charge of someone else. In other words, there's the expectation that they're going to receive this truth and they're actually going to live according to this truth. They're going to put it into practice. This is the very thing that Jesus told his disciples on that mountain at the end of Matthew 28. Look back at Matthew 28 and look at verse 20. After he told them, make disciples, baptize them, verse 20, he says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now, I want you to think about that verse for a moment because there's a real subtle difference between what this says and what we do. It does not say, teaching them all I have commanded. It says, teaching them to observe, to obey, to put into practice what I have commanded. I think the church really does pretty good at teaching people what Christ commanded. You come every single Sunday, you're going to hear a sermon about the scriptures and you're going to hear about how this points to who Jesus is and how we can live according to the gospel of Jesus. You can go to any community group and you're going to learn more about what Christ commanded. You can go to the equip classes. You, you can have online resources. You have all these ways to receive what Christ commanded. We could teach you to death what Christ commanded and still not obey this scripture. Because this did not say teach them what Christ commanded. It says teach them to put into practice, to observe what Christ commanded. In other words, you and I have to be taught how to obey. We have to be taught how to take what Christ commanded and live it out. And that's the beauty of discipleship. It is built on something called accountability. Very simple concept. Accountability says you know what you ought to do. Let me help you put into practice and actually do what you know you ought to do. So, so if we could just be honest with ourselves for a moment. 99% of us in this room have a knowledge level about here and an obedience level about here. We know a whole lot more than we actually obey. The vast majority of us in here have this problem. And accountability is about closing that gap. It is about saying, here's what I know I ought to do. Help me begin to put it into practice. And this is where these discipleship groups, especially in this small setting, we're one on three together, guys with guys, girls with girls. When you do in this discipleship setting, you can get really up close and personal and hold each other accountable. And one of my favorite parts, there's this preset accountability. It's pretty intense and rich, but there's one question at the very end. It's my favorite question. It's called the one thing question. At the end of group time, you're supposed to share with everybody, what one thing am I going to do based on what I've learned. So whether it was through the reading or something the Lord is speaking to me, our discussion, what one thing am I going to do? How am I going to put this into practice? 
And the beautiful part is the next time I gather, just a couple of weeks later, we're going to gather together. And I'm going to look three guys in the face and tell them whether I did my one thing or not. You'd be amazed at how much more I get accomplished when I know I'm going to have to look at three guys in the eyes and tell them I didn't do something or I did do something. Accountability helps me start doing what I know I ought to do. Now, here's where it, it comes back to leadership. To lead a discipleship group doesn't mean you have to be this amazing teacher or you have to have answers to everything. All it means is you have to help people put into practice what they already know they ought to be doing. There are so many avenues of learning nowadays. You don't have to be the guru who teaches everybody. You can read a book together. You can watch a video together. You can do something else. There are all these platforms of learning. All you have to do is hold the group accountable to learn and then start putting that into practice. And this whole discipleship group material that we have is set up to help you, if you're ready to lead in this, to have all the structure you need to help people start to observe what Christ commanded. It's possible. Our job is to disciple you or to pour into you to help you so that you can go out and do this for others. We'll teach you how to do it. But even if you know how to do it, that doesn't mean you're going to do it yet because there's one other thing that could be stopping you. It's the third reason why I, don't, I think we don't make disciples. We don't make disciples because we just don't think we can do it. We don't make disciples because we just don't think we're equipped, we're good enough to do it. This is where typically you'll look to me and the other pastoral staff and you'll say, you guys are the ones with the seminary degrees. You guys are the ones who are always doing churchy stuff. Y'all are the ones who can do this. I can't do this. And your problem is you look in the mirror and what you see is somebody who's not gifted enough, who's not smart enough, who's not spiritual enough. And you're going, man, I, I don't have any degrees in this. I haven't been trained in this. I'm not capable of this. And here's your number one reason. I guarantee your number one excuse is, who in the world would want to be discipled by me? You'll look at me up here on this stage and you go, of course somebody wants to be discipled by you, Jason. You're the pastor of the church. But who would want to be discipled by me? I know you feel that way because you don't feel equipped and capable. But let me tell you, you're not making disciples of you. You're making disciples of Jesus. And apparently anybody can make a disciple of Jesus. Because just look at who he commanded to do this. These original, this original group of disciples, these were not wealthy, educated, they weren't even all that gifted. These were just ordinary, rural Galileans who had an extraordinary God living inside them. And all of a sudden, what was impossible became possible. This is why Jesus, looking at these Galileans, these nobodies, leaves them with the last part of verse 20. So after he's given the command, teach them to put into practice everything that I've commanded you, he says in verse 20, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Man, there is no more beautiful promise in the entire Bible than what Jesus just said. He said, those of you who are my followers who are going to take this out to make disciples, I am going to be with you. This Jesus is the one who had just been resurrected from the dead, who has all authority in heaven and earth. He's looking at these nobodies, and he says, guys, you can do this because I'm going to be with you. He's looking at these disciples, and he's saying, I'm not going to be beside you anymore. I'm going to be inside you from now on. He said, I know you used to sit by and watch me do my thing. Now I'm going to do my thing through you. You are going to start to see the supernatural because the supernatural is going to be inside you. And if you look at the book of Acts, that's exactly what you see taking place. I mean, you see these ordinary people, and all of a sudden they start speaking in languages they don't even know. They start healing people. Their shadow goes over somebody. The dude steps up, and he's healed. They start multiplying like crazy. Peter, this, this coward, preaches a message, and 3,000 people come to faith. In the book of Acts, it says that walls start shaking and chains start breaking. The church starts exploding. This incredible stuff happens. Why? Because these disciples were amazing? Please. Liars, cowards, prostitutes, murderers. They weren't just ordinary. They were subpar. But they had a supernatural Jesus living inside them. And when Jesus is inside you, nothing's impossible. And that's the same promise he gives you and me. That when we come to faith in Christ Jesus, that Jesus, like the most powerful radiation treatment ever, comes in and just starts burning out all the sin and shame and guilt and mess inside of us. And he heals us and cleanses us from all that's attacking us and killing us. And the very spirit of Jesus comes inside of us and fills us with himself and makes us supernatural beings where nothing will be impossible. But let me, let me be clear here. That does not happen to every person in this room. Jesus was very clear in his teaching. 
If you have not come to faith in Christ, if you have not repented of your sin and placed your faith in Jesus to save you, you do not have the spirit of Jesus inside of you. You will remain ordinary and incapable because only Christ in you can change you. You have to become a disciple of Jesus before you can start discipling anybody else. We're going to hear more about that next week. But this week, this morning, you have the opportunity to say, I need you, Jesus. I'm ready. I'm ready to give my life to you. I'm ready to follow you. I want you inside of me. When this service is over, you can go talk to somebody about that. We'll, we'll tell you what you can do with that. But you've got to decide today you're going to do it. I know, though, there are hundreds of you in this room who have already made that decision. You've confessed your sin. You've placed your faith in Christ, which means Jesus himself is living inside of you. And let me tell you what that means. That means I don't care who you are. You can make disciples. You have the power. In fact, it is in your weakness that God's going to get even more glory. It's not because you're talented enough or you know enough about the Bible or you're a good enough leader or even because you have enough margin in your life that you're going to make disciples. In fact, it's going to be because you're not a good enough leader, because you don't have enough margin in your life, because you're not skilled enough that when you make disciples, the people around you are going to go, dude, if this fool can make a disciple, anybody can make a disciple. Jesus must be in them. Same thing they said about Peter and John. These are ordinary men doing extraordinary things. They must have been with Jesus. They'll say the same thing about you when God uses you in your weakness to make disciples. The only question is, are you willing to say, I believe Jesus in me is enough? Now here at this point, I'm praying that some of you are starting to get a little bit inspired. I'm praying that some of you are going, maybe, just maybe, God could use me. But there's one fourth reason that's keeping you back. One last thing, it's the hardest of all of them. Even when you know you should do this, even when you understand how, even when you know that God can use you, here's the fourth reason you don't make disciples. We don't make disciples because we just don't know if it'll be worth our time. We don't make disciples because we just don't know if it's going to be worth the time. And make no mistake about it, the act of making disciples is a time commitment and a large one. No one has enough margin to do this, which means you're going to have to throw some things out of your life to make enough bandwidth to do this. And in the crazy mess of your life, with all the important things you got going on, you're going, I got nothing I could give up. How in the world am I going to have margin to do this? And here's my answer. It's the gospel. The gospel is the answer to it. Because if you stop and think about who's giving this command, like I said before, it is Jesus, the dude who went to the cross to pay for your sins while you were spitting in his face, while you were rebelling against Almighty God, Jesus said, I love you enough to pay the penalty of your sin, to take all God's wrath upon my shoulders so that you could be healed and saved. He's resurrected from the dead and he comes to us after doing all that and says, I just want you to tell other people the good news of what I've done for you. Make disciples of them. How much more motivation do we need in the gospel of Jesus to say, right now, I'll obey you, Lord. I mean, think about it this way. What if it just so happened, middle of the night, your house catches fire, some kind of electrical wire burns up, and your whole house is burning, and you're caught right in the middle of it, and there's no way out, and you're going to be burned up in this thing. And then out of nowhere, you hear the sirens, and the fireman comes in and beats down the door and comes in with his his uniform on, puts an oxygen mask and a blanket around you and tears you out of that house and saves your life. Then a few months later, he comes to where you're living now and he knocks on your door and he says, hey, we're, we're trying to let society, let the city know about the good work the fire department's doing. We were wondering if you take a little time to record a video for us so we can get the good word out. How much of a putz would you be if he said, no, I don't got time for you right now? It just saved your life. And all they're asking is for you to get the good word out. Christ has saved us from the flames of hell itself. He has rescued us for the, from the greatest penalty at the greatest cost. And he has come to us and said, would you go tell the good news of what I've done for you and help other people enter into that same salvation? What more motivation do we need than the gospel of Jesus? And I know some of you, though, you're going, man, praise God, yes. I, I want, but I want to do more. I don't want to just, just waste my time on three people. Man, I want to change the world. I want everybody to know what Christ has done. I want to go to the ends of the earth. I want to shout on the mountaintop. I want to do something that's going to change this world. You want to know how to change the world? Grab three people and start discipling them. 
But look at what Jesus did. He didn't even just have the 12. If you look at his life, he narrowed it down to three people, Peter, James, and John, the ones who became the pillars of the early church. Why? Because he knew if he was going to revolutionize the world, it came down to this. Let me invest in someone who can invest in someone who can invest in someone. And then a movement that is exponential begins at that. In fact, I want you to see a glimpse of what this looks like. I want you to get a feel for the exponential power of making disciples. So, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to act as if I'm, I'm making some disciples right now. I'm going I'm to need a little bit of help right here. So you, sir, you're going to come up here and, and help me if you don't mind. Man, would you mind coming up here and helping me out? So you all going to come up to the front. Joshua, come on up. He told me he wasn't going to come up here, so I had to come first and get him. All right, so you guys, I'm, I'm discipling you right now, or, or imagine that I am. So we are now a, a D group, right, one on three. We are making disciples. But the whole part of making disciples is that I turn around and send you out to make some more disciples. So this is the first generation, but let's have a second generation. I want the three of you to go get three more people and bring them back here to the front with you. All right, let's do it. Okay, three more people. Would you mind coming up here with me? Okay, you got to come on up here with me. Let's see. All right, you're coming on up. Y'all come on up here with me. Where are my disciples? Oh, yeah, okay, one, two, three. Here we go. They're still, they're, okay, we're making it. We're making it. So we should, if my math is right, have 16 people up here. There's two generations, so I've discipled three, and the four of us went out to get three more, so that's four groups of four, 16. But we're just beginning. Let's do a third generation. Now, we're all going to go out. You're going to have to go some further to the back. Let's get three people that we're going to disciple. Bring them up front with us. All right, new responsibility. Y'all are all sweating right now as we come. <laughs> Nate, come on, man. Right, you're coming with me. Tuck, you're coming, dude. Come with me. Rose, you're, you're coming with me. Okay. Tucker, how you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Sometimes I forget the microphone's on when I'm talking to people. All right. We have we got some disciples over here. Right, right, right. Okay. You have your disciples? Did you get one? Yeah. Get two more. Oh, two more. Two more, yeah. <laughs> right, Got to work the mathematics out right here. All right, all right. Who invited Josh up here, man? Golly. He's actually in my real D group. That's pretty funny. <laughs> all right, so if my math is right, there should be 64 of us up here right now. But there's still a lot of people out there. That's, that's just a few generations. Let's do a fourth generation. I want you all to go get three people. And bring him back up here with me. Come on. Thomas Barnes, you're, you're mine, brother. Come on up. All right, why don't you come up here with me? All right, you want to come up here? Come on up here with me. All right. Oh, it's getting busy. It's getting out of control. Did you get your three? Okay, awesome. All right, making disciples of Jesus. And we're going to have a mass sprinkling up. No, I'm kidding. We're not, we're not going to do that. All right, so if my math is right, which I'm sure there's some margin of error in this whole thing, we should have about 256 people up here. That's, that's four generations of disciples. You started with me. I grabbed three. Yeah, praise the Lord for that. Y'all are clapping because you didn't have to come up here. Four, 16, 64, 256. Now, if I were to ask you to go out, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. But if I asked all of you to go get three more, there would be no one else left in this room. It would be over 1,000 people who would be down front in five generations. Let me tell you what that means. Two things that this means. It means, first of all, if we don't get outside the walls of this church, we're done. Five generations, and we scooped up everybody. There's nobody else left to disciple inside our congregation. This is why he said, as you go out through life, we got to go out into our neighborhoods, into our workplaces, into our schools, into our restaurants, into our shop, everywhere that we're going, and make disciples, or the movement stops. But let me tell you the second thing that means. It means that when we do that, you cannot stop it. By the ninth generation, we'll be at 256,000 people 
who are actively being discipled. That changed, that's also almost all of Arlington, Texas, because there are disciples making disciples who make disciples. That is how you change the world. All right, guys, why don't you head back to your seats. Let's give them a big old hand for, for that. As they're heading back, here's, here's what I'm saying. I believe every single one of you in this room needs to be a part of a discipleship group. You, at a minimum, need to be discipled. Getting into a community of people where you're able to look just a few others in the eye and let them have access to your life. Every one of us needs to have that. And my prayer is over the next few weeks that hundreds of you will say, I'm ready, I'm convinced, I need this in my life. But let me tell you what I'm asking for right now. In order to have hundreds of people in discipleship groups, it means we need to have at least 100 leaders. People who will say, God, I'm ready. It's time for me to make disciples. I know I don't know what I'm doing yet. I know I'm, I don't feel equipped and sufficient for this task. I know my life is crazy. In the middle of all that, God, I believe Jesus in me is enough. I'm ready. And if that's you, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. When you came in this morning, you were given a little piece of paper, hopefully. This will, go ahead and grab that right now. If you didn't get this piece of paper, raise your hand. We're going to have ushers who will bring this out. Because I want everybody to at least have the opportunity. So ushers are going to grab that. Keep your hand up high in the air. They're going to start bringing those around. They'll start trickling around to everybody. But while your hand is in the air, here's what I'm asking you to do. Keep that hand up in the air. This says leader commitment. I commit to lead a D group. Then it says print name. So you'll write your name and then write your email address as legibly as possible. And then there's a little blank right there and it says I did not receive a leader kit. Don't worry about that quite yet, that last part. If you are feeling ready to say, oh God, here I am, use me. And I know your hand in the air doesn't mean you're necessarily saying that. Just keep your hand up <laughs> so we can get you your cards. If you're saying I'm ready for that, then what you're going to do is you're going to print your name and you're going to print your email. But let me make sure you know what you're signing up for. You are saying I commit to at least six months of walking with three other people in a D group to facilitate a D group. It means that I'm willing to do this, and again, you may not feel ready, but our job is to get you fully trained, to get you all the resources that you need, to make sure that you're ready. We will have this to keep you one step ahead of the people that you'll be leading. We're going to give you that, everything that you need to do it. You're just saying, I'm ready. And let me also say, this does not mean I'm ready to do this in three months or six months. It means I'm ready to do this right now. Because our hope and prayer is that by the time this sermon series is over, we'll have launched 100 groups at least by mid-February. So we're saying now that you're willing to say, God, I believe you can use me and I'm ready to step into this, to be obedient to that command. This does not mean, please hear me in this, if you want to be a part of a D group, to be discipled by somebody else, I think many of you will fall into that category. Praise the Lord. That's going to be the next couple of weeks. Keep coming back to hear about that opportunity. This is if you feel ready to lead a D group. Could be you've already been in a D group before and you're ready to step back into the role. Could be you've never had anything going on in a D group, but you're ready to be used by God in this capacity. If that's you, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask right now for the pastors to make their way forward to grab some boxes. So all the pastors are going to come, grab some boxes. They're on the sides, and they're going to be lined up around the front and around the room. If you are willing to do this, I'm going to ask you to get this card, fill out your name, your email. Don't check the box or the line right there about the kit. You're going to bring this up here to one of the pastors, and that pastor is going to do two things. They're going to give you one of these kits right here. The same thing we were passing out last week. If you, if you got one last week, praise the Lord, you don't need to get another one. But if you didn't, and you're saying, I want to do this, you hand the card to one of us, we're going to hand you one of these kits. And then we're going to put a hand on your shoulder and we're going to pray a quick prayer of blessing over you, just reminding you of the power and the presence of Jesus as you make disciples. And so we're asking, are you willing to step into this space in your life right now? My prayer is for 100 people to be willing to say yes and for us to fill them up over the next few weeks. That means there are dozens of you in here who will need to stand up and say, God, use me. I know I'm not ready, but I'm, I'm willing. That's what I'm going to ask you to do. So I'd like you all to stand up if you don't mind right now. 
Many of you, in fact, most of you may need to just stay where you are praising God. We have a reason to celebrate because of the gospel. And maybe you need to consider why you haven't yet placed your faith in Christ. That's fine. Stay where you are. But if you're here this morning and you're saying, I know I need to make disciples. I know I've been needing to do this and I'm ready. I'll take the step I need to take. You come, bring your card up to one of us pastors and we'll give you a kit. We'll pray over you. Now's the time. You do it. Watch it. Praise the one, just the voices. Y'all sing with me. And no oh, praise the one who paid my debt, and he raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt, and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, it's Jesus, only Jesus.
Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. And all to Him I owe. My sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He washed. He washed it white as snow. One more time. He washed it white as And I know there's a mutual feeling of like, oh, Lord, what am I stepping into right now? Praise God. You're supposed to have that feeling of humble dependence upon God. I'm in over my head, but Lord Jesus, I'm going to trust in you. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to just say a couple things, and I'm going to pray over you and send you out. These pastors are going to stay down front because I know this happened in the last service. This happened in this service. There's some of you going, I missed my window. It's over. I know I'm supposed to go down front. I just can't get my legs to move. Well, we're going to send everybody out. And if you need to come forward and grab one of these boxes and say, use me, God, they're going to be here. There's a few left over for you to step up and say, yes, God, use me. Now, maybe you're here today and you're saying, I need to talk to somebody about knowing Jesus. I need him inside of me. Right outside these doors is the hospitality area. You'll see a glassed-in area. And there'll be counselors who would love to tell you about how to take that step of faith or to pray with you for whatever you need. I'm going to be outside these doors. If you're a guest, it would be my great honor to shake your hand and thank you for coming to the church this morning. If you didn't stop by the guest tent, we have a gift to give you. Even if you did, I'd still love to, to meet you and welcome you to the church. So you come on by over there. Also, if you're saying, I'm ready to be a part of this church, we have covenant membership class tonight, this afternoon at 4.30 at our Grand Prairie campus. I'm going to be there. A few other pastors will be there. We'll tell you about what it means to covenant together with this great church. We'd love to see you there. And don't forget about the equipped classes and opportunities that we have for you. But I'm sending you out on the task to make disciples. This is God's call upon you. So why don't you bow your heads with me? Let me pray over you. God, thank you so much that you love us enough to send your son to die for us. And you've given us a commission to tell the good news of what you've done, God. Give us the audacity to do so, to make disciples of Jesus. God, use those who stood up. God, those who are wavering, call them to come now and to say yes to you. Lord, use us because you're worth it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Fill the church. You are sent.